Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to show you how I painted the Jack Russell on the right hand side. Now the videos that I've uploaded to YouTube in the last few weeks for the acrylic side have been more of the Jack Russells. That has been a coincidence and it is just because I had a couple of requests asking if I could show different type of textures for the Jack Russell. After I uploaded the first one of Kevin, the Jack Russell on the left side, a couple of weeks ago. So this one is of a similar texture, they're both smooth coated and got that softer appearance. Now as always I start off with the eyes first. So first off my big tip when we're painting any eye is to make sure that we've got the reflection in the eye in the right place. Really study the values in that reflection as well. Now here there wasn't any blue that you will typically see if the photograph was taken outside. So you do want to make sure that you're paying attention to the colour as well. But here if you do notice that within that lighter highlight you've got some grey values then make sure that you put those in as well. Now just like with the shape of the eye you're going to predominantly have more of a shadow on the top edge which is where the eye is slightly sunken into the skull itself. So the top eyelid will then cast that shadow. You can see that perfectly here on this eye. So I want to make sure that I've got the 3D sphere shape of the eye in place from the very beginning and this is why I always start off with the eyes with any portrait. The eyes are the soul of that animal so I want to make sure that I've got the shape, the expression, the emotion, everything that stems from that eye correct from the very beginning. This is why I get the eye you know, done before I move on to any other element. Once I'm happy with that you can now see that I'm starting to block in the fur around the eye. Now here for this I am not focusing on the exact colour. I really don't think that's important at the very first stage. I can adjust that very easily within a few seconds with a glaze on my final layer. Once I've got a good base layer down, I've put here more of my predominant burnt sienna values going on top more with the yellow ochre colours. I'm going to be able to allow all that darker burnt sienna layer to show through. When you do come to then add your details on top, you don't want to be covering the layer underneath completely. The reason why we work from dark to light is to allow the gaps in between our brushwork to act as the shadows from the highlighted lighter layers that we're putting on top. Now you'll see here that although I'm working with quite a vibrant base layer, I'm still making sure that I'm working with my subtle layers. Now this is something that I talk a lot about in my slower tutorials on Patreon. Because all of that is predominantly real time, you're able to see how I move in the brush, why I'm layering in the way that I like to, to create this type of photorealism. Now if I was to put my base layer down and then go straight in with my lighter details, sort of what I'm now starting to work on here, I'm not going to have nowhere near the same amount of depth within the fur. I have to build up more of the layers in between before I get to my lighter layers that I'm working on at the moment. If you imagine, we want to be painting the fur that's closest to the skin and building up from there. If I was to have put my base layer down first and then jump to my brightest highlights that I see in the reference photo, that is not going to provide the same amount of depth within the fur. I want this to still look like short fur, of course, but the short fur has the same amount of depth with any kind of texture, regardless of whether or not it's a long-coated dog or a short-coated dog. I still want to make sure that for that fur type, I've got the right amount of depth for the fur texture I'm trying to create. If you are doing any painting of any animal and you feel like your fur isn't as realistic as you'd like, it maybe doesn't have the same amount of depth or contrast that you're after, the main reason will usually be because you don't have enough layers. Now something there that I mentioned was contrast. Now if you've seen some of my videos here on YouTube, you'll know that I think that contrast is so important. It's what I focus on more than my exact colour. Now here you can see I've got my base layers here of the ear and on the top of the head nice and dark. It's already now making the marking of those burnt sienna colours around the eye more lighter because I've got something that's dark next to it. And that's something that can often be the case. If you think you've mixed the right value of paint, so what I mean by that is if you think your mixture is light enough but you don't feel it's showing up in terms of your detail, there are two things that are usually happening. One is potentially your base layer isn't dark enough so your details aren't able to be as clearly seen or it's that the layer or the, the element next to it isn't dark enough. So let's say for instance the marking here on the top of the head. If I went in more with a cold grey rather than more of the darker brown mixture I've got here, the details that are next to it or on top of it will not be as bright. So as soon as you adjust your contrast, you make your shadows darker, whatever is next to it will appear much brighter.
And just by focusing on these two elements, it can make such a difference to the overall feel, depth and realism of your painting. Now what you'll see at the bottom of the camera there every so often, you will see my hair dryer. Now one of the common complaints that acrylics get is that they dry too fast. Now when I first switched over from oils to acrylics, I did find the drying time was a bit of a challenge, but there are many cases, as you've seen here, that I actually try and speed up that drying time. With acrylics, you have the best of both worlds, so you can speed that up, but you can also slow it down. And again, I show this on my Patreon versions as well, my tutorials over there. So you can use a fine mist sprayer bottle to keep that layer of paint wet for as long as you need. You can then make them work similar to oils. Now, if you are using a hairdryer to speed up the drying time, there are a couple of things that are really important. So you want to be holding your hairdryer about you know, a foot and a half, two feet away from the canvas. You don't want to be applying too much heat to that surface. Acrylics are plastic based, so you don't want the paint to, to bubble up. One other thing as well is wait for that surface of the canvas to go back to being like that room temperature. If you touch that canvas and it's still warm and you apply more paint on top, that's going to dry even quicker. So obviously the acrylics, we don't want it to potentially dry even faster. So just wait for that surface to go back to room temperature. It won't take too long, but just keep touching that just lightly with your fingers. And if you do feel any kind of heat there, just hold off for another minute or two. So normally, once I've got the left side sort of more about the level that I've got here I will then start on the right eye and then the fur around the right eye and then I'll piece the puzzle together. I do like working in small sections like this because I do think then it stops any one part of the painting from becoming too overwhelming. When you work in set layers it can absolutely work and if that's how you like to work then that is great there's no problem with that but if you do find that you hesitate a lot more because you're spending more time looking at your reference photo thinking what bit should I paint now it's a lot easier to get lost when you're working in a larger area break something down into one or two square inches it does become far more manageable and that's really how I work on every single drawing painting regardless of the medium that I'm working in. And here, now you can see that the left side is about 80% complete and here I'm just now working with refining my base layer. You can really see the importance of getting that base layer as accurate as you can in terms of your contrast and your shapes. So you can see that I've not gone down with one solid colour. Now again, this is something that I cover in depth in my Patreon tutorials because I think it makes the process much easier. If I were to go down with one solid colour, I'm going to be potentially harder to follow that reference photo. I always speak about reference points and I'll do it throughout any painting. If there is a specific marking, so for instance, maybe the little eyebrow there, you've got some of the markings underneath the eye, the darker shadow. I will pick those and I will paint those in first so that I've got a reference point. I can then look back at that reference photo and I know exactly where I am from the very beginning. It really does help to eliminate all of that hesitation. There are many times when I used to work in larger areas where I would sit at the easel and I would just sort of stare at my reference photo thinking, right, what bit am I actually working on? There were two reasons for that. One was I wasn't really picking and isolating that reference point. So I knew exactly where I was when I looked back at my reference photo and my artwork. And the other was because I was just tackling an area. It was just too big. I really needed to scale everything down. So also one thing that I'd like to mention is I do have the six and a half hour tutorial of Kevin, which is the Jack Russell on the left, which I uploaded a YouTube version of here a few weeks ago. I do have the six and a half hour version on Patreon now. The reference photo and line art are provided for those who do want to paint along. So if that's of interest and any of my other slower tutorials, I will link my Patreon in the description below. One thing that you will notice is my details here, they look nice and smooth. You can't see the grain of the canvas showing through, so it doesn't make my details look like they're broken up. Now, I really like this look. I don't like working on anything too textured. If you're finding that the details you're creating, you can see that texture of the canvas and it almost makes your details look like they're broken up, it will be because the surface you're working on is a little too rough. 
So a canvas of the smoothness that I like where it doesn't require any additional work is something like the Windsor & Newton Professional Cotton Smooth Canvas. They come with the pink label or you've got the Fredericks Ultra Smooth Blue Label. Now both of those I don't have to apply any gesso to them. They are good to go straight from the packet. But if I use Windsor & Newton Canvas Boards for instance I do find that they're a little bit too rough. I just don't feel like I can get my details as smooth. So what I like to do is then apply two or three layers of gesso. I will wait for each layer to dry and then lightly sand it so that I can then get that surface smoother. With each additional layer of gesso that you apply, it will get that slightly smoother surface. Now, depending on how smooth you want that, you just keep on repeating that until you've got that level of smoothness that you're after. But for me, two or three coats is usually enough. And while we're on the subject of that, I will just mention that I personally don't work like working on something that's ultra smooth. So like really smooth, almost like um, glass or plastic. For me, I find that that is too slippery. The paint doesn't really stick as well to something with a little bit more texture. So there's a bit of a fine balance there. But if you do go down the route of applying gesso to your surface, you will find the, the couple of attempts that you do, you'll start to find the right balance with how smooth you personally like it for the details that you want to create. So I have a video here on YouTube where it, I'm showing you my top tips for painting realistic fur. I will link that in the description below if that's of interest. Now there are a few things there that I mention, one of which is fur direction. So now that I've zoomed out here of my camcorder and you can see more of Frank's face, you can really see how important the fur direction is for determining the structure of the face. So I always say that the shadows and the highlights are not random and here it proves it perfectly. If you look at the highlights above the eye and below the eye, they are all curved, they look three dimensional because it's showing that there is a structure under the skin like the eye socket, the cheekbone, where it's really reinforcing then that fur direction. The fur direction there does follow all of that anatomy under the skin. If we get that slightly wrong, it is going to then adjust the shape of the face. And not only is the fur direction important, but also the fur length. So how long I keep that brush in contact with the canvas is going to obviously then determine how long that brush stroke is. So for instance, the details on the side of the ear compared to the bridge of the nose that I'm currently working on, there is a slight variation there. The ones on the ears are two or three millimeters longer. Now that is deliberate because the fur there is not going to be as short as what it is on the bridge of the nose. So what's really important is occasionally keep zooming out of your reference photo and looking at that photo as a whole seeing right where is the fur longer and where is it shorter paying really close attention to make sure that we get that as closely as we can in our painting because just like fur direction it will then change the shape of the face but not only that it will change the fur texture so let's say that I have a tendency to make my brush strokes too long in this case I am going to make it look like he's a longer wiry haired Jack Russell rather than the short smooth coated dog that he actually is so the fur length here and the brush strokes we're creating are just as important as the direction and whilst we're working on the fur detail, it's always important to pay attention to that light source. So you want to make sure, as always, and I mention it an awful lot, that we've got good contrast. So the nose here is a prime example. I've got the areas really dark where needed, and now I'm reinforcing my highlights. Really now starting to capture the shape of the nostrils, the highlight on the top of the nose, and that very subtle highlight between the two nostrils, more of like that midline. Working from dark to light here, always reinforcing that slightly wetter appearance of the nose is what's going to make it realistic. Now when it comes to the bridge of the, like sort of the muzzle area and the bridge of the nose, when I'm working with white fur here, I want to make sure that I'm working from dark to light. With acrylics, we have that benefit of not worrying about filling the tooth of the paper like what we do with colour pencils or pastels, graphite and so on. So here we have that lovely ability of working how we naturally see it in a reference photo, which is working from what's closest to the skin, so what would typically be darker, and building up from there. Now white fur is tricky so I do have a long tutorial I think again that's about six hours on Patreon of this white bulldog which I'll put a photo in the corner so if you would like to see that and paint along the reference photo and line art for that are provided with the Patreon tutorial and I do focus on how to get that white fur that short white fur realistic from the very first base layers to your final details. Now you can see here that I'm using a multiple like type of brushes trying to get different brush strokes for this very short white fur.
I'm paying really close attention as always to that fur direction. But where this is sped up, you can see that I'm shifting from the left side and the right side. That is deliberate because for me personally, the bridge of the nose and this area is one of those parts where I do have a tendency to get my fur direction a little too vertical. So they end up a little bit too straight, not enough curve within the brush details. Now, because I know that I do have a tendency to, to do that, in order to fix that, I will add a few details to the right hand side, I'll add a couple to the middle and then to the left. The reason why I switch between that technique is I've then got three reference points where I'm looking at that photo on those only two or three details in each of those sections, left, right and middle, and I can then really see, right, okay, all I've now got to do is sort of fill in the gaps in between. That means then that I'm following that reference photo accurately from the very beginning. So if you do find that you have a tendency to do that because above the eye where the fur is joining onto the top of the head, that's also sometimes where we do either make the brush strokes too flat, so they're too horizontal, or again, they're too upright, they're too vertical. What that will do is it will make, if the, the brush strokes are too horizontal, you're going to then make the dog's face look really wide. If it's the other way and you've made them too vertical, you're going to make the dog's forehead or the bridge of the nose look really long. Obviously, that's not what we want for both options. We need it to be accurate to that photo. So, as I've said, my way of getting through that and overcoming it is by filling in two or three details within that one larger area on the left side, middle side, and then on the right. And then you can just fill in the spaces in between. It makes it so much easier. So if you've watched Kevin, the other Jack Russell here on YouTube, you'll know that I did the chest area with my airbrush. So if you would like to see that, I will link um, Kevin's tutorial in the description below as well. So the reason why I use my airbrush, as you can see, it creates that beautifully soft base layer. Now the airbrush, you don't need to buy an expensive setup in order to create something like this. I started off with my Iwata Neo airbrush. It had a 0.5 needle, worked perfectly. That is a really good airbrush and I loved it. I've still got it now, it's never let me down. It also works really well for doing the background. So I do all of my backgrounds here with my airbrush as well. It just saves so much time. This was a 16 by 20 inch canvas and I had the entire background done in about 15, 20 minutes, which for something this size, if I was using traditional brush work, would have taken hours. So if you've got any questions about the airbrush inside of it, then always pop them in the comments. Like any art related questions, I'm more than happy to answer them and help if I can. And the biggest consideration here is, as you can see, my brush strokes are significantly longer. The fur on the body here is longer. I want to make sure that I replicate that in my painting. I'm also using a slightly thicker brush. So this is now more of a round shaped brush. Now I'm going back with my liner. So there are different brushes that you can use at various layers to create different types of texture. You don't always want to be using the same brush from the very first detail layer all the way up to your final layers because the fur can end up looking a little bit fake, a bit two dimensional and flat. So by varying the brush strokes at different stages, you're going to help to adjust that texture, getting that softness with your thicker brushes to start with, saving your finer liner brushes for your last layers where you can then hint at more of those finer sort of details that sit on top. So one last thing I'll mention before I wrap this up is, as you can see, I always leave whiskers until the very last layer. These overlap everything else. They overlap the neck, the chest, parts of the face. So if I was to have painted these in earlier, I'd have to then work around them and that's going to make my life so much more harder and the process is going to be far longer. So always leave those whiskers until the end. So here is a photo of the finished painting. I really hope the tips and techniques that I've shared here have been useful. If they were, I'd really appreciate it if you could give the video a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you'd like to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And as I've said, I, if my slower tutorials in pastels or acrylics are of interest, I will link my Patreon channel in the description below. I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube next week. And as always, thank you so much for watching.